Okay, and I will get my full screen here. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, why is this a little different? Oh, there we go to home. Okay. Yeah, and then slideshow okay. from beginning. Okay. So welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm Linda Frank and I'm a, a state and national board certified reflexologist and I am the uh, director, founder and director of Reflexology Academy Northwest. And I was telling Elizabeth, I love giving these presentations because I continue to learn so much about the subject that I'm presenting about. And in terms of the vagus nerve, there's a lot of information. Um, so with, uh, with that, I will start with um, an introduction to the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a cranial nerve. There are 12 of them. And the vagus nerve is uh, referred to as CNX, cranial nerve 10. All of the cranial nerves originate in the head. Hence the title cranial nerve, many of them from the brain stem, which connects the brain to the spinal cord. So the brain stem goes right into the spinal cord. The brain stem is involved in basic survival actions like breathing, heartbeat, digestion, gagging, sneezing. Um, these are actions that we don't have control over, although certainly our breathing we can control, So, but, but we don't have to. It happens automatically. All of the cranial nerves are involved in helping us get food. So they're involved in basic survival whether it's the optic nerve, so you see food, or the olfactory nerve, smelling food, hearing, hearing for uh, something, some kind of prey that might be in the area. Um, then we get to the vagus nerve, which is immensely involved in the digestion of our food. And the accessory nerve, which, um, which blends right in with the vagus nerve, the accessory nerve is cranial nerve 11, um, it moves the head. It's the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscle, this big kite-shaped muscle. So that helps us to expand our realm of food uh, possibilities. The cranial nerves, most of them, are related with the parasympathetic nervous system. So our nervous system is divide, has numerous subdivisions. And in general, we say we have a sympathetic nervous system, which gives us our fight or flight, um, our response to danger. And our parasympathetic nervous system oftentimes has been referred to as the rest and digest or feed and breed. So we can see that the vagus nerve has also has an impact on fertility. There we go, rest and digest, feed and breed. The vagus nerve is called the wanderer. It's the longest nerve in your body. And also it wanders to these various organs. So it wanders up to the head, to the ears, to the eyes, to the nose, etc. Um, and then it wanders to the throat, to the esophagus, to the larynx. So vocal cords are impacted by and can impact the vagus nerve. And that's key for later in the presentation. The lungs, the heart, the spleen, the kidneys, the stomach, the liver, the small intestine, and much of the large intestine, all innervated by the vagus nerve. So you can see here, where's my cursor? There it is. From up around the ear, down, it wanders around to all these organs. The vagus nerve is like your body's walkie-talkie. 
it's got two-way communication to the brain. So that'd be called a mixed nerve. I'm getting a little AMP anatomy and physiology wonky here, but um, two-way communication. 20% of the communication is from the brain to the body. 80% of the action is from the body to the brain, meaning the vagus nerve is picking up feedback from all those organs from our digestive tract. And as we'll see a little bit later, even the microbiome, even the little microbes that live in our gut talk to the brain through the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve has a huge role in mental health. It can change the activity of neurotransmitters like serotonin. And serotonin, interestingly, about 80% of it uh, is produced in the gut. So having a, a large impact on depression, <clears throat> norepinephrine, which helps to regulate our system, and GABA, <clears throat> excuse me, which calms our system. These neurotransmitters are involved in epilepsy and other neuropsychic psychiatric conditions, such as depression and anxiety. The vagus nerve helps in memory making, so it plays a big role in Parkinson's and some um, <clears throat> and um, ADHD and bipolar disorder. Now, vagus nerve stimulation. There were devices that were approved back in 2005 and are being used today for conditions like depression and epilepsy. I just saw an article a couple of weeks ago that the National Institutes of Health, I think it's 15 million that they've devoted to, um, to investigation into the, into the vagus nerve because stimulating the vagus nerve with a device can have such a, an amazing impact on um, rheumatoid arthritis, all inflammatory conditions. The vagus nerve is involved in social engagement, empathy. Beyond mental health and memory, the vagus nerve helps us see, hear, talk as essential in human interaction. In fact, it's the root of a theory called social engagement system. Now, interestingly, in this picture, I thought it was interesting that this woman who is the one who looks rather depressed is looking down. When I studied neuro-linguistic programming, uh, we were taught, and you can, you can try this out, when especially kids, but adults also, when you see people looking down, oftentimes they are accessing emotions. So if a kid is having a, a temper tantrum or is in one of these sulky, whiny, crying kinds of phases, if you get them to bring their eyes up, imagine what it would be like to, you know, to whatever their issue is kind of thing. Bringing their eyes up can take them out of that uh, depressive state. So... That's just want to throw that in as a, an FYI. So part of this theory about social engagement relates to the ability for you to feel more calm when engaged in non-threatening eye contact and to filter out background noise in order to tune into other people's voices. It also affects the muscles in the face and larynx, the voice box, to control facial expressions and vagal and vocal tone. The gut brain access is enabled by the vagus nerve. So it enables, in fact, it's said that it's usually the gut brain that responds first to circumstances and then it gives a message to our brain up in our cranium, up in our head. The vagus nerve helps to modulate inflammation. So a certain amount of inflammation after illness or injury is good, it's normal. In fact, I'm gonna throw in an aside here because I think it's a really important one. I've been reading uh, several articles lately that taking N, what they call NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories may move a condition from an acute condition, meaning it's just temporary 
into a chronic condition because it impedes the inflammatory process. And our, our systems, our body mind is, is trying to, to complete a job. And if it doesn't get the job done, it's gonna keep trying, keep trying, keep trying to complete it. So Tylenol is supposed to be, and I, I have to wonder now as I'm saying it, I have to wonder if the study was funded by Tylenol. So I'll have to go look. <laughs> um, but Tylenol is supposedly the only NSAID that um, that won't uh, potentially kick in that turning of pain from acute to uh, chronic. The vagus nerve operates a vast network of fibers. They're stationed like spies all around your organs. So when it gets a signal for incipient inflammation, the presence of what we call cytokines, and with COVID, you may have been reading about cytokine storms that people actually can, can die from cytokine storms. It's like an over flooding of cytokines, of responsive um, um, proteins. It alerts the brain and it draws out anti-inflammatory neurotransmitters to regulate the immune response. So you can see the vagus nerve has a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of, um, of impact on our system. Electrical stimulation, which as we know was FDA approved in 2005, um, reduces inflammation and may even stop it altogether. The creation of implants to stimulate the vagus nerve via electronic implants showed a drastic reduction and even remission in rheumatoid arthritis, which is, has no known cure and is often treated with toxic drugs. Hemorrhagic shock, other serious inflammatory conditions. There's a burgeoning field of medical study known as bioelectronics that may be the future of medicine. This is a photo from the Mayo Clinic. So here is the vagus nerve coming down from the ear, down the neck, and this is where they put the implant. And then of course the vagus nerve, as we saw, would continue down through the thorax where the heart and lungs are down into the abdomen. Mayo Clinic, about one third of people with epilepsy don't respond to anti-seizure drugs. Vagus nerve stimulation. So they're stimulating for epilepsy with the vagus nerve implant. May also for people uh, be appropriate for people who haven't responded to intensive depression treatments such as antidepressant meds, psychological counseling and electroconvulsive therapy. Additionally, researchers are studying vagus nerve stimulation as a potential treatment for conditions, headaches, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, bipolar disorder, obesity, and Alzheimer's. So really a wide, wide range of conditions. The vagus nerve initiates relaxation after stress. So it revs up the vagus nerve revs up the fight or flight responses, or excuse me, your sympathetic nervous system revs up the fight or flight, pouring stress hormones into your body. And the vagus nerve says, chill out, releases acetylcholine. So the tendrils of the vagus nerve act like fiber optic cables that send instructions to release enzymes and proteins like prolactin, vasopressin, and oxytocin. Oxytocin is called the nursing hormone. It's a, a hormone that tends to um, engender engagement. I had read a study years ago. Actually, I had read two studies Back when I first started reflexology, I read a study about UCLA researchers who realized all the stress research was done with men. So what about women? What might be the difference between how men respond to stress and how women respond to stress? Well, it turns out women oftentimes release oxytocin, the nursing hormone. Men also have nurse, uh, oxytocin, by the way, just not in the amounts that women do which as these researchers described, it makes the women wanna sit around the table, roll up their sleeves and say, how do we solve this? What do we do? Whereas 
these researchers asserted that men tend to want to fight or flight under stress. Um, people with a stronger vagus response may be more likely to recover quickly after stress, injury, or illness. I just want to make the point that not all stress is bad. It's actually an important feature in our survival in a number of ways. So this is a fabulous TED Talk, and we don't have time to view it tonight. It's 14 minutes long, and it's, it's uh, Kelly McGonigal. She's a researcher at Stanford. And it's called How to Make Stress Your Friend. It's a fantastic, if you get a chance to watch it, I highly, highly recommend it. You can also, Stanford has a stress intervention toolkit. They have a department that studies stress. So they have, I think they're, it's called Spark Tools, S-P-A-R-Q, Spark Tools. But um, it's uh, Stanford Intervention Toolkits Rethink Stress. So if you I found it just by Googling, you know, because I've seen it before, um, Stanford Stress Department Toolkit, I think, or something like that I put in. So as long as you know it's Stanford and there's a toolkit. And it's got some nice um, uh, information in it. This was an article that, this is a research, a study that was done at Harvard, and it was written up in the New York Times. So this is traditional versus alternative views about stress. I just figured because they're predicting now almost 90% of doctor visits are stress related. So why not add a little bit more about stress into this presentation, especially since the vagus nerve can decelerate our stress. So can our views about stress. So when I'm stressed, my body releases adrenaline and cortisol, my heart beats fast, the common interpretation of that is, oh my gosh, it's increasing my risk for cardiovascular disease and heart attack. Whereas an alternative view that's less stressful for you is to think, oh, my heart is working harder and my body's mobilizing its energy to get ready for a challenge. The second one would be my stress response is causing my breathing rate to to increase. That means that, so the stressful response to feeling your breathing increase would be my fast breathing is a sign of anxiety. I worry about how stress is affecting my mental and physical health. Instead, you can think, oh, I should take a deep breath. My faster breathing means more oxygen is getting to my brain so I can think more clearly. Another one would be, I can feel my blood pressure rising. This can't be good for my health. The alternative view would be circulatory changes are allowing more oxygen and nutrients to fuel my muscles. I'm feeling stronger. I'm ready for the challenge ahead. And um, part of the write-up on this study at Harvard was that people who took that alternative view um, did better on exams, um, faster re uh, response times. I mean, just it was, it was um, clear that these alternative views, non-stress related, you know, um, really had an, a wonderful impact. So I wanna introduce you to something called polyvagal theory. Stephen Porges back in the mid 1990s, I think it was, um, is the one who, who realized, wow, we do, we, we sort of go through three stages of response or have three options to respond to stressful, traumatic, anxiety, you know, um, uh, catalysts, e experiences. One is, and this is the oldest system, and I'll go into this in a minute, it's called dorsal vagal. So polyvagal meaning, it used to be when I was in, when I was in massage school in 1980, we learned sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system, um, rest and digest versus fight or flight, just those two options. Another option is freezing, and that's called the dorsal vagal state. And so it, it puts us into a, a state of conservation of energy. We might even dissociate from the experience, pull away, <clears throat> not gonna feel it. You think of a rabbit freezing, right? And when they come out of their freeze, so I'm going on another little tangent, but when they come out of their freeze, 
uh, oftentimes they'll run really fast around in circles or helter skelter, or they might pant a lot, like um, because they're burning off the chemicals of stress. So the fight or flight chemicals have been released into the system, but the nervous system, instead of making the decision to fight or flee, it's gonna just freeze. The nervous system makes the decision for us. The nervous system says, I'm safest if I just hunger down and sort of like pretend I'm disappearing. That's dorsal vagal state. Then we have the fight or flight response, which floods our muscles with these with cortisol and adrenaline and enables us to take action. And then the third response would be social engagement. Because as we'll see in a, in a subsequent slide, um, we need other people for our survival, right? Even going back to all the cranial nerves are involved in us getting food, right? Social engagement would have a lot to do with getting food. If you think of wolves and the hierarchy from the alpha wolf to the poor little is it the beta or the delta um, who, who, you know, has to wait until the scraps are maybe left over for it. Um, so social engagement has a lot to do. Someone doesn't like you, they're, they're not, they might give you a really small piece of birthday cake instead of a nice ample size or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that's polyvagal theory. So this, these are re in reverse order. We saw in the last slide, dorsal vagal was at the top, the freeze, the collapse, the immobilization. Um, and it happens in the diaphragm, in the heart, in the gut is where we would tend to feel it. Um, and it sh we shut off from the threat when we can't fight or flight. Then sympathetic, the mobilization happens along the spinal cord and it mobilizes the body. And then ventral vagal is that engagement, that social network. It's the top of the regulatory or evolutionary ladder. So our nervous system is perhaps the most important determinant of our mental and physical well-being. There's an iceberg. Of course, we know what's lurking under the water. Our thoughts, this is pretty cool. Our thoughts are the tip of the iceberg. The activity of our nervous system is 87% or more of the iceberg that scient scientists estimate is submerged. In other words, this is all happening out of our thought process, out of our conscious awareness. So this again is talking about polyvagal theory states that our nervous system determines how safe we are, how connected we are, or how connected we feel in day-to-day -day life. Some states will lead to disconnection, withdrawal, and self-protection, while others promote social eng engagement, exploration, and curiosity. So your nervous system is constantly monitoring. Am I safe? Am I safe? It evolved to protect us from danger. Um, and it does kind of a listening beneath the level of conscious awareness. The nervous system responds to environmental signals through the three pathways. And it does so in order that, that in the order that these pathways evolved. So uh, this is based on a book that I just recently got, The Polyvagal Theory in Therapy by Deb Dana. It was actually recommended by another uh, reflexologist who said it's really written in layperson's terms, really helps uh, someone to understand what happens with these three states. I'm not going to delve in, but the, the first pathway is the dorsal vagal. It's the oldest prep pathway approximately 500 million years old and responds by immobilization. If your nervous system is like a home, the dorsal uh, pathway, vagal pathway is like a dark basement, responds to danger by putting us in a mobilized state. The dorsal vagal state is freeze. Here's the possum, right? Play possum. 
less blood and oxygen flows to the brain when we're in dorsal vagal state, so often results in a decline in cognitive ability. We might feel numb, frozen, absent. When it comes online, it, it, when we are in a situation of extreme danger. And because we can't escape physically, we attempt to escape mentally. Shut down in order to survive. That's why many trauma survivors experience dissociation in the midst of a traumatic event. Responses made are made by our nervous system, not by us. So whether we get a red light, a yellow light, of sympathetic nervous system or a green light of safe in ventral vagal state. It depends on how our nervous system interprets the situation, whether it be dorsal, sympathetic, or ventral. Neuroception comes before perception. Neuroception meaning the nervous system, how it perceives a situation. Pathway number two is the fight or flight. And, and this is kind of interesting when I looked at this visual and pulled it, it sort of looks like it's coming from the head, but again, it's not. Our nervous system is making the decision, not us. We're not sitting there going, let's see, should I flee or should I fight? That would take too long. Nervous system goes, we're gonna do one or the other. So around 400 million years ago, we got equipped with this fight or flight. Returning to, to the metaphor of the home, the sympathetic pathway is like an alarm security system. It's there to put us into that fight or flight, flooding us with adrenaline when we sense danger. So we either engage with the perceived threat or we avoid it. But we avoid it by getting away from it. In our evolutionary past, it allowed us to sprint away from predators, climb a tree or sprint away or climb a tree. However, back then it would come online and then we would go into a different state. It would be followed by a period of relaxation, soothing and recovery. Nowadays we stay, many of us, stay in sympathetic mode a lot throughout the day because we've got all this stimulation that we're responding to or that our nervous system is trying to respond to. Being in sympathetic state, by the way, can also cause us to misread social cues, like seeing neutral faces as angry or just thinking every, you know, they're against me, I guess a little paranoia. The third pathway is the ventral vagal. And this is what we're going to talk about, how we can engage the ventral vagal state. It's the last to evolve. It's around 200 million years ago, often referred to as the social vagus. It becomes active when we feel safe, connected, socially engaged with others. Spending time in ventral state is vital for mental and physical well-being and is associated with recovery, curiosity, creativity, exploring new possibilities, and a willingness to experiment. Here we feel calm, hopeful, and open to change. So if someone's stuck in, in dorsal vagal or sympathetic state, it's going to be really hard to change them. Got to bring them. And this is what the therapists do who work with polyvagal therapies is to, you know, smile, eye contact, various um some of the one technique that I'll show you today is used. In fact, when I read it and it's in this book and I, I have a PowerPoint slide with it and we can put it up, Elizabeth, and when, if it gets posted on YouTube. Um, so the subtitle for this is it's accessing the healing power of the vagus nerve, self-help exercises for anxiety, depression, trauma, and autism. You don't have to have any of those conditions to benefit from the um, simple movements, mostly eye movements, but some head movements in this book. Um, but they do give some examples of like autistic kids actually looking at their therapist um, by doing this simple eye movement exercise. It can be very profound 
for getting us out of either dorsal vagal or um, sympathetic state. In our evolutionary past, social connection essential for our survival. We talked about that. Plus, without the safety of the tribe, right, we would be an easy meal on the savanna. So co-regulation is seen as a biological need that is as important for mental health as food and water are for physical health. In fact, there was an article that's um, going without social involvement, social connection, can be as harmful as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And there are many ways that we can get um, our social connection. And certainly Zoom is one way um, that we have learned to, um, to make connection and be able to maintain connection through the pandemic. So here it's the autonomic ladder, dorsal vagal state, just sort of folding over, collapsing into oneself, sympathetic, fight or flight and ventral vagal, safe, fun, peaceful. Rewiring our nervous system. So our nervous systems have plasticity. So this means that although the self-protective strategies of our nervous system may have become habitual, they are not set in stone. And you know, when I when I came up with the title for this talk, the vagus nerve, a key, a key to physical and mental health. We have several keys, right, to physical and mental health. We have diet, good diet. We have sleep habits, good sleep habits. Sleep work more and more so is being talked about as a really critical factor for both mental and physical health. We have exercise, right? We have social connection. Um, one of the nice things about epigenetics um, Bruce Lipton is a researcher who was a forerunner in the field of epigenetics, epi meaning to sit on top of. So epigenetics meaning something sits, a, a substance, I'm not sure if you'd call it a protein, um, sits on top of a gene and gives us the ability to um, help to determine how our genes get expressed. So we're not just condemned to living out conditions that we've inherited. So epigenetics that we can change them. And likewise, with the vagus nerve, we can do something to help and then and then, you know, through other means to help to change the habits that we have uh, that our nervous system has um, become used to. So with the right approach, we can rewire for greater connection and safety. And even if it's currently dormant, our ventral vagal system is always there waiting to come online. So how can we reset our nervous system, our vagus nerve, to put the brakes on stress? sound and oh remember the vagus nerve innervates the vocal cords right so by inducing sound and or om or singing we can help to tone the vagus nerve simple as drinking water or swallowing there was actually um um a research study I read about with done with kids, I think they were like middle schoolers and they found that chewing gum, now I'm not advocating chewing gum necessarily, but these kids did better on their exams when they chewed gum, why? Because they were swallowing, 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 swallowing. So just, you know, remembering, oh, I wanna kick my, um, engage my ventral vagal system just drink some water or just sit there and nobody needs to know what you're doing. You don't have to usher out an ohm or start singing in the middle of a meeting, right? You can simply drink some water or swallow. Ending with a cold shower when you're taking your morning shower or evening shower, uh, ending with some cold water can... Um, what do I want to say? Tone the vagus nerve. 
and breathing deeply. Breathing for numerous reasons, the vagus nerve goes through the diaphragm, right? So if you can imagine the diaphragm is the muscle of breathing, it's underneath our lungs. And when we breathe in, we flatten out the diaphragm and it pushes down on the liver, it pushes down on the stomach. So it actually is, and I just was in a class um, all of this morning about our lymphatic system. And they talked about the breathing and the motion of the diaphragm helping to pump lymph fluid of the abdomen. So deep breathing. And it said that um, holding the breath can be very helpful. So I like to use Dr. Andrew Wiles 478 breathing technique. So let's do one or two rounds of it. And then I have a video, but when I go to videos, I go out of the PowerPoint. So we'll do um, the, that video and the eye movements to tone the vagus nerve. We'll do them uh, at this, you know, subs, uh, one after the other. So let's breathe in for four. Then we're gonna hold the breath for seven counts. And then we're going to exhale for eight counts. And we'll do that like twice, just so you can get a sense of breathing in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and exhale, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, exhale, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we'll do it along with a Dr. Andrew Weil with the video. But by, by holding and by exhaling the long, longer than you've inhaled tends to make us take an even deeper inhale. And then we'll do this basic, what's called the basic exercise by Stanley Rosenberg and helps most people move into a healthier, calmer, functional uh, nervous system, state of the nervous system. And also helps to reposition the first and second uh, cervical vertebrae in the neck. And then there's a second part to this that's in the book, Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve. If we have time, we'll do it tonight. And we use reflexology to engage the vagus nerve. These are Jessica's hands. I see Jessica was, uh, is on. Um, so these are Jessica's hands. She was a student of mine. She's out in... Um, Spokane, Washington. Um, and this is a class, one of my classes. You can see we work in a zero gravity chair or on a massage table. And we have um, several techniques for engaging the vagus nerve, but I'm gonna teach you one that's super, super, super easy. And I think most of you know what reflexology is, but just really briefly on based on the belief that there are maps of the body on the feet, hands, and outer ears. And reflexology is the art and science of applying firm and gentle alternating pressure to points on these maps. And we help the body normalize function. We're not doing it. We're just giving stimulation to help the body to know what needs adjusting. And reflexology isn't a substitute or alternative for medical care, but a complement to it. So this is the vagus nerve point that I learned. Sometimes if you look up a video on YouTube, you'll see them refer to this upper location. And some maps that I've looked at, I've looked at a lot of maps to try to nail this down. Um, some maps show both. In fact, I had found a map um, or a, a picture rather of stimulating the vagus nerve. This is the only place in the body where the vagus nerve comes exterior. So it actually 
has a, a surface point. Everywhere else, it's in some cases deep, in some cases um, not as deep, super, more superficial. But here it comes um, external. And I'm going to grab my ear real quick, my big ear, so you can see exactly where I am pointing. Although Dr. Noget, who was the French physician who mapped the um, the what they call the European ear points, Dr. Noget says if you press anywhere in what's called the conca, so so the vagus nerve point here's the ear canal, right, and the vagus nerve point is right about here. Right about here, let me use a pointer. Right about there. Before you would dip into the ear canal, you're still, it, the, the surface is you know, pretty hard, so to speak. Um, but if you're, if you're close, he says, if you're anywhere in here, these are heart and lung reflexes, you're still gonna be impacting the vagus nerve. So, right here and you can you can do this while you're driving i would just do it one side at a time so that when you stop at a light you're not sitting there like this right or in a meeting you know you could be just sitting like this and again both fingers would be a giveaway that you're doing something a little interesting um but um you hold it if it's tender, it might be a little tender. You can hold it either for like 20 seconds, a minute, or you can hold it until it stops being tender. Okay. Or as I say, if you Google up a uh, vagus nerve point in the ear or some of the reset the vagus nerve videos on YouTube, um, you might see this other point, which is higher up, let me get my pointer again, which is right in here between the folds. But I like to go with this one because that's the one that I learned. So that gives us access to the vagus nerve. Accessing the healing power of the vagus nerve. Now I'm gonna stop sharing and we're gonna go do this really simple eye movement that is so wonderful. Um, Okay. Whoop, and I got to come back to you and share screen again. Oh, and um, Linda, you know about the uh, video and uh, sharing sound options at the bottom of the shared screen? Uh, oh, share sound. Yeah. Optimize for video clip. Perfect. Okay. So let's all do this together. Hi everyone, Amit from Upod here. I'm gonna describe in a very short clip how to do the basic exercise by Stanley Rosenberg, uh, as described in his book, Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve. Uh, I'll put some links below uh, so you can have more references. But this is just to describe how to do the exercise, which is very simple and will take only a couple of minutes. So before you start the actual exercise, you want to sit upright, comfortably upright, and you want to just turn your head from side to side, just very gently. Turn your head from side to side and just notice how it feels. So see if it feels like you have even movement to the right and the left and see if one side feels more restricted maybe you have pain, limitation. If you do feel pain or even discomfort, maybe try to give it a number from one to 10. So let's say I turn my head to the right and I feel a restriction, little discomfort, and I would call it five out of 10. So that at the end of the exercise, you can try to do the same thing again. And then maybe, hopefully, you feel a reduction in the pain or the discomfort and you feel more freedom of movement. So here's the exercise, super simple. 
Please lie on your back. I'm going to do it sitting up, but please lie on your back, especially in the first few times that you, it's okay you do, do the exercise. Yeah. And interlock your fingers and place them against the back of your head. So you're lying on your back, you're comfortable, you're resting, and your hands are behind your head. While you're there, feel the weight of your head sitting in your fingers and have a sensation of your fingers at the back of the head. So a moment of awareness just to that position. Then, very important, keeping your head centered, turn only the eyeballs to look to the right. So only the eyes turn to the right as far as you can go comfortably. And then you stay there like this. So you're going to keep the eyeballs to the right and you're going to keep your head exactly centered for up to a minute, maybe 30 seconds to a minute. While you're there in this position, looking to the side, you may feel a spontaneous yawn or a sigh or a swallow. If you feel that, slowly bring your eyes back to center. If you don't feel that, it's fine. You will probably feel it next time or the time after when you practice the exercise. At the end of the minute, bring the eyeballs back to center. Take a moment here in the center and then turn the eyes. Just the eyes turn the other way. You stay there, the head is centered. The eyes are looking to the left and you stay there for 30 seconds up to a minute. And again, if during that time you feel a spontaneous yawn or a sigh or a swallow, take it as a sign to bring your eyes back to center. Then stay there for another few moments and slowly sit yourself up again. Make yourself comfortable, try not to slouch, but sit upright so that your upper body is organized properly. And again, just look to the side slowly and just observe the differences. That's it. That's the basic exercise. Super easy to do. You can do it every day, every other day. Uh, the more, the merrier. Thank you. Helen Hatzel was able to win any uh -oh. competition she took part in. She was known as the contest queen because she had won seven trips to Paris. Not part boats, of my houses. She would basically <laughs> take part in any of my presentation. She read about any contest. Okay. I'll keep that up there though. In case we want to come back to it if we have time. Okay. And again, I am going to go to, oh, well, let's, um, let's actually, before I share that, let's stop share. Um, so how, go ahead and turn on your microphones. If anyone wants to give feedback, how that was for you. I definitely felt the second time I could stretch further the, the second time. Isn't that fabulous? And in part, that's because that ninth, uh, 11th cranial nerve, the accessory nerve, innervates these muscles that turn the head for you to be able to see more of your food options if we were to go back to, uh, to um, long ago times. Anyone else? I could uh, feel a difference also on the right side. It was like congested more. And when we, after the exercise went back and it was not the pressure, not the congestion on that side. Great. And that took all of less than a minute, right? Yeah. About a minute. So, you know, you can slip into a, a, a public restroom or you can, you could, you know, sit there if you're on a public transportation on a bus or something no one needs to know what you're doing if you turn your put your eyes close your eyes and just move them to the left there is a second as i mentioned a second piece of this where we are actually moving the neck muscles um along with the eyes but um i'm looking at the clock i want to be mindful of time so um anyone else want to share um, yes, um, it was, uh, similar, um, uh, to, uh, how, how she felt, but mine was on the left side and, um, yeah, uh, it, I, I had the yawn, um, 
um, experience. And it's, it always just, um, every time doing that exercise always just like brings a smile to my face. Cause it's like, that is so cool. <laughs> that is like that, that amazing exercise can bring on that response and have it be that quick. It's yeah, fascinating. It, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty darn amazing. I felt, I don't remember how I found this book, but um, I felt like I'd really stumbled into something fantastic when I did. Okay. Use Anyone? this technique to relax before bed sometimes because it does yeah. bring on spontaneous yawning for me, both both directions. Yeah. And you don't need to do the hands. You can just hold your head straight and you know go to the left, go to the right. And I find I can do that and, and still get the same effect. And this I use sometimes to put me back to sleep if I wake up in the yeah. wee hours and I can't get back to sleep. So, yeah. And if you just put your fingers lightly um, below your skull in the back of your head and move your eyes from left to right, you can usually feel your muscles moving. Interesting. So that's pretty wild that you think it's just happening here in the eyes but that the, it's actually connected to the muscles at the back of your head. So we have I just have a, a few a minutes. Few minutes. Oops. Oh, uh -oh. Getting an echo. Um, any questions? And then we can do the Andrew Wild breathing if we still have time and would like to do that. Okay. Very good, Linda. Okay, good. I hope it, this has been helpful. So let's go to breathe with and Dr. Andrew Weil, and you'll know then where the uh, where the video is. The famous four seven eight breath, the relaxing breath that I teach to all patients and doctors and students and friends, uh, another yoga breathing technique. Uh, in this, you try to keep your tongue in the yogic position, touching the tip of the tongue to the ridge of tissue just behind your upper front teeth, like that, and try to keep it there the whole time. You breathe in quietly through your nose to a count of four, and you hold your breath for a count of seven, and then blow air out forcefully through your mouth. <sighs> Helps if you purse your lips out, and you make a whoosh sound when you do that. So the exercise begins by letting all the air out through your mouth. Then you close your mouth, breathe in silently to a count of four, hold your breath for a count of seven, out through your mouth audibly to a count of eight, and you will repeat this for four breath cycles. Looks like this. That's it. Um, you must do this at least twice a day. You can do it more frequently if you want, but never more than four breath cycles at one time, at least for the first month. After a month, if you're comfortable with it, you can increase to eight breath cycles, and that's the absolute maximum. It's desirable to slow the whole exercise down as you practice it. What limits you is how long you can comfortably hold your breath, but as you practice that, you'll get better and better at it. And um, after doing this for four or six weeks, uh, you can begin trying to use it for things. Um, if somebody says something that pushes your button, you do this exercise before you react. Uh, it's a great way to deal with cravings. It's a great way to help you fall asleep. If you get up in the middle of the night for any reason, get back in bed, you do the exercise, you'll fall asleep easily. After two months, three months of regular practice, there are very significant changes that happen. 
in physiology. This lowers heart rate, it lowers blood pressure, improves digestion. Uh, it is a very powerful anti-anxiety measure, in fact, much more powerful than the anti-anxiety drugs that are commonly prescribed. Takes no time, needs no equipment, very time and cost effective. Everything to recommend it, so I urge you to begin practicing this. Wow. Any feedback about the breathing technique? I mean, I feel really energized. Mm -hmm. Good. So with that, I'm going to take my energy to my and my appetite and um, and go have dinner unless there are any questions. Now, do we have the link to that video with Andrew somewhere? I will get, um, so Elizabeth, you thought maybe you'll put this up on YouTube and then I can put the link. Okay. Um, the two yes. links. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I can add it to the, to the description of the video and um, the Stanford stress toolkit link yep. is in the chat. Um, oh, okay. I know I'm going to be looking into that and using that with my clients because that's a thing that comes up a lot with my new nutrition clients is that they're too stressed to eat or they mm. or they're they're so stressed that they overeat. So I'm really excited about that. Thanks for always bringing amazing knowledge and getting me inspired. <laughs> I love resources. <laughs> I like so to put, on, put the help into your hands. That's okay, Lorraine, go ahead. I just was wondering on the YouTube video, so what do we look for um, to, to access that video? Let me put in the chat our video YouTube channel link. Like and subscribe, press the, the bell icon. And then um, every time that one of our videos is uploaded, um, you'll get a little um, notification, but we have classes from uh, 2021 and there's actually um, several classes from our lovely Linda. And um, so check it out. And then um, there is, um, I try to over the weekend post the, uh, the, 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 the week that just happens videos to keep consistent um and um uh, yeah and then also so after um the uh, zoom meeting there is a, a little survey if you have a chance please feel free to take it it's um it's to help me uh, i'm scheduling the um uh, the 2023 classes i want to make sure that we get some good topics that um our customers will be interested in and we'd love to hear your feedback Oh yeah, I had another slide, one more before oh, I, yes. um, that was the second book that I showed you um, by Deb Dana, Polythe uh, Vagal Theory and Therapy. So that's my final slide. Thank you for attending. And thank you to Marlene's Market in Delhi, really for year, decades of dedication to healthy eating and educating the public. They do these um, talks, you can get the schedule online um, under classes, I think it is. Um, and uh, they do about eight classes a month. So some pretty fantastic information available. Compliments of Marlene's Market and Deli. Well, it's, it's all, uh, it's a huge thanks to amazing presenters such as yourself that are willing to take the time um, to, uh, you know, be here with us and share your knowledge and expertise with the community. And um, we're just so grateful. And we're uh, grateful for everyone here on the call. Super appreciate you. And um, yes, um, stay tuned um, for uh, more classes. Um, I actually just updated all the classes through the rest of the year. Um, and so if you go on to the link I uh, put in the chat box here, um, you can see what's coming up. I'm also teaching a cooking class through Marlene's um, this next month on comfort foods that are healthy for you. So um, that's, that's going to be a really fun one. 
And um, I'm also putting on a uh, nutrition workshop at a local health club um, that I work at. Um, and if anyone's interested in that, email me and I'll, I'll send you the info. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.